Good evening, church. Thank you, Steve. <clears throat> I want to tell you up front that what I'm going to tell you this evening came from uh, that book that I mentioned to you a couple of weeks ago, and it's by Jack P. Lewis, and talks about, I don't know, so many different things that are basic beliefs is what the title of the book was, and this, the second chapter is the doctrine of creation. I am not going to tell everything that he did, because what, what's going to happen is I'm going to start telling you this stuff, and I'm going to run out of time because that was a lengthy, lengthy section. So I'm going to tell you everything I can, and we're going to go from there. This one is the doctrine of creation. Paul spoke about the doctrine of creation when he was talking to the people of Lystra, and he said, of the living God who made the heaven and the earth and all that is in them, in Acts chapter 14, verse 15. And he spoke to the people of Athens, in Acts chapter 17, verse 24, and he told them about the God who made the world and everything in it. So when we start looking at the Bible and we start hearing the things that we hear in the world, it, it doesn't match up. People in the world are telling us that there is no God. That doesn't fit with what, we're, what, we're, what we come here together for every, every single time. It was not true of the gods whom the people of Lystra and Athenians worshipped. That's not what they believed. They did not believe that there was a god or that the god made the heavens and the earth. What they believed was that Zeus and others in Greek mythology did not make the world. They had simply taken over what the Titans had done. Okay? So whatever the Titans had done, that's, that's where the Greek gods, I guess they would be the small gods, even though they were greater than anybody on earth. Then there were demigods and all sorts of, that's what they taught. But they, they believed that everything came out of matter that was eternal and that the universe had brought the gods into being rather than the gods bringing or a god bringing things into existence. And they said that, that everything evolved out of natural processes. The concept of evolution or of creation is not only significant in opposing idolatry, where people worship the creator rather than the, worship the creature rather than the creator. That's what Rome, Paul said in Romans chapter one, verse 23, but it's crucial in determining our behavior as well. What the Greek gods did was taught everybody that, oh, the Greek gods are a lot like us humans. You got one that's drunk, you got one that's a warmonger, you got one that's a goddess of love, or maybe even a god of love. You got all sorts of different gods that, that have the same characteristic as humans, and so if you have this, whatever this characteristic is in your life, then you must be following that particular god. The creation idea emphasizes a different behavior. It emphasizes that there is a God and He is the creator of the world. And so everything that has gone on in this world, especially over the past 100 or 150 years, has declared there is no God or that God is dead or that what we thought was God was just science. And we'll talk about that in just a few moments as well. The creation idea emphasizes the great power of God. In Psalms chapter 33, verse 9, it says, He spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood forth. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 5 says, By the word of God, the heavens existed long ago and an earth formed out of water. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, it tells us, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Creation is expressed repeatedly and stressed throughout the entire Bible. Not just only in the book of Genesis, but all throughout the Bible. They refer back to that and they, they 
refer to God being the creator. Over and over again, we read about that. In, in Exodus chapter 20, verse 11, God made heaven, earth, and the sea, and all that is in them. The psalmist alluded uh, repeatedly to the creation and to the creator. I had a list of verses that I could read to you, but Psalm 33, verses 6 and 7 are a couple. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and all the hosts by the breath of his mouth. He gathered the waters of the sea as in a bottle. He puts the deeps in storehouses. In Psalm 148, verse 5, let them, talking about the sun and the moon and the heavens and the waters above the heavens, let them praise the, the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. The prophets, Amos chapter 4, verse 13, for behold, he who forms mountains and creates the wind, the Lord God of hosts is his name. In Jonah chapter 1, verse 9, So Jonah said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Isaiah is full of them. The book of Job has several. John chapter 1, verse 3, Through the word all things were made that were made. And, and when we get to that point, we're, we're understanding that the word is actually Jesus who became flesh. Verse 14 says that that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Verse 3 says that Jesus was there when everything was created. The Word, through the Word, all things were made that were made. Paul talks about in Romans chapter 4, verse 17, of a God who calls into existence the things that do not exist. And in Ephesians 3, verse 9, the God who created all things. And there's other resources other verses that we read in Hebrews 11, Steve, Steve got up and read to us just a moment ago. By faith, we understand that the world was created by the word of God so that what is seen was made out of things which do not appear. In Revelation 4, verse 11, you created all things and by your will they were created and have being. This Bible, this word that we read consistently throughout it tells us that God created everything and that because of God it continues to exist in him all things consist is the word that Paul used in in Colossians in him all things consist they continue to exist let's bow forward of prayer and then I want to talk about evolution Heavenly Father, thank you so very much for your word telling us how you created everything. And, and we pray that you will help us to trust you on these things. Even though we don't always understand everything, even though we don't understand much at all, sometimes we, we come to find out that, that we understand a lot less than what we really think we do know. We pray that you'll help us to trust you. Help us to live by your word. Help us to speak by your word and to behave because of you and your word. Help us to live our lives in a way that would please you and honor you. And out of that, we will have respect for each other and the things that you made in this world. Help us to live our lives based upon the fact that you are God and that you do sit on the throne and that you are our Lord and Master. And we praise you for, for giving us the opportunity to also have you as our Savior by sending your Son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins and raise him from the dead to give us hope of eternal life. We pray these things through his name. Amen. I want to talk about the faith of evolution. Now, some people who would believe in evolution would say that, well, it's not, it's not faith, it's, it's scientific fact. And let me give you a few examples of how it is faith. Those who claim to be scientists that say these things are providing theories that oppose biblical teachings. Obviously, they, they oppose biblical teachings because we've just read several verses, a bunch of verses, that tell us that God created everything. And they're saying there is no God. So they're saying by that, not every scientist says this, by the way. Let me point that out. I'm telling you that the ones who do say these things are opposing God and everything else that's in the Bible. 
Some will say that life developed on earth from non-life. Scientists will say this. And so when they, they found a box full of cloth and things and found that after a few days there were a bunch of rats that, that got into the, well, let me, let me go back. I, I almost said it wrong because they didn't say they got into that box. What they said was that they evolved from that box. And they did all sorts of experiments to try, to try to prove that this was the truth, but they couldn't. They could never prove that, and, and you know, and you and I both know, and, and it has been proven since then that rat, rats did not evolve out of that box of dirty clothing. Everybody knows that now. But back then, in that day, they didn't know any better, and that's what they assumed because, well, they put out a box of, ra a box of rags, and, and rats came out of it, and so therefore... Well, that must have been spontaneous generation. This concept has been debunked, and yet it is still taught as truth in other ways. Evolution is faith. There's no evidence for spontaneous ge generation. In fact, Louis Pasteur demonstrated and taught us that a completely sterile atmosphere produces nothing. It produces nothing. How did those germs get inside of the water? How did those mosquitoes come out of that water? They must sponta spontaneously generate because you've got water and you've got nobody putting anything into it. It's just air and water. So therefore, it must be spontaneous generation. Well, you all know and I know that that's not the truth. So they just keep getting smaller and smaller and they try to get it down to the cellular level and they try to tell us that things spontaneously generate. They haven't been, to been able to prove it, and no evolutionist can prove it ever, anywhere. The evolutionist has to assume that spontaneous generation once took place in order to believe that, but he knows that it does not happen anymore. It does not happen anymore, if it ever did. And based on scientific evidence, we know that it never has happened. Everyone knows that acquired traits are not transmitted. Rats with their tails cut off generation after generation. You know what they produce? They produce rats with tails. Cutting their tails off doesn't do anything because they acquired that some other way. The actual fossil record does not establish the case of evolution. The fossil record does not support the case of in-between species creatures. This fact makes for a continuous search for missing links, which to this point do not exist. Creatures may appear for which there is no evidence before, but, in no, but no in-between creatures have ever been found. The artist paints pictures of an in-between creatures, but those pictures are only artist conceptions. They're not real. There's no evidence that that creature ever existed. None whatsoever. There are limits beyond which crossbreeding cannot be done. Genesis speaks of creatures bringing forth after their kind. One cannot cross a dog and a cow. They cannot breed a female horse, or they, they can breed a female horse to a donkey and get, one, get, a, get a mule out of that situation, but the mule is sterile and cannot reproduce. This creates problems for the claimed upward progression of species. It doesn't happen. It doesn't go from a sparrow to an eagle like Mr. Darwin wanted us to believe. It just doesn't happen that way. If one wants to project gigantic leaps forward in the evolutionary chain, he has to project such a leap for both male and female in the same area at the same time for ongoing continuation. Otherwise, it won't happen. If the male was born in one or, or was created or evolved, I guess we've got to get back to the word evolved for this, if he was evolved at a certain time and there was no female, then he's the last of his species and he dies out with no reproduction. It just won't happen. The 
the biblical teaching of creation carries with it some very heavy implications. Idolatry comes as a result of people's failure to recognize the Creator. It doesn't come out of people making up gods. It comes out of their desire to have their own way about things and not recognizing the Creator. That's where idolatry comes from. Another major ramification or implication is that the world we live in becomes God's world. All things belong to Him. He is the ruler. His power is absolute. And people and the world are dependent upon Him. And people are, the stewards, are in a steward relationship. That is, we are put here to take care of things until we're done. Psalm chapter 8, verse 5. And we are accountable to God for the use of His creation. All of us understand accountability. We're accountable to each other. We're accountable to others that are above us. Some are below us, and they're, they're accountable to us. And what example I'm giving here is that parents are responsible to take care of their children, and their children are accountable to the parents. And when we're an employee, we're accountable to our employers. And when we're employers, we're accountable to the proprietor or the owner. When there's a big business, everybody is accountable to somebody. Well, the owner isn't accountable to anybody. Yes, he is. There are laws in the government that make sure he doesn't break anything, break any laws that will hurt anybody and won't steal from other people. Well, the government is above everybody, so they don't have any accountability. In this country, the government is accountable to the people. Everybody is accountable to someone. And when it gets to the last person who is above everybody on earth, they may or may not realize it, but they are accountable to God. And they always will be. Everyone is accountable to God. The Creator knows how things ought to operate to accomplish the purpose that He had in mind. He is not only the Creator, but He's also the lawgiver. And the world serves God's purpose, and He will bring it to His desired end. God is the one who created it all, including all the laws that we call laws of nature. That guy named Isaac Newton did not invent gravity. He learned about it. He observed it. And he made some conclusions based on those observations. And so he knows that there is a law. But even Mr. Newton knew that God was the one that created that law. If a person in a, here's another one. In a, if a person in a creature made in God's image, if a person worships a creature made in God's image, standing at the crown of God's creation. I, I think I'm messing this one up. I think I have a, a typo in here. This, this isn't making sense. I, I think that this is talking about a person who is, who is a creature made in God's image is standing at the crown of God's creation. His moral and ethical responsibilities are different from those he has if he were merely an animal which was developed further than any other animals have. That makes more sense. If a person is a creature made in God's image, then we're going to imitate our God, God our Father. That's, that's what's going to happen. And we are going to see ourselves as having responsibilities as being in God's image. We wouldn't see that so much if we were an animal. Animals don't seem to really care so much about humans or other animals as humans do. The idea of creation makes a lot of difference in what a person thinks of himself. And you, if you think you're just an animal that's a little bit better evolved than something else, or that you're at the top of the food chain, then that means you can do whatever you want to do. And you can get away with whatever you want to get away with. Even if it means that you can treat someone badly who is on a lower intellectual level than you are because you're so much smarter than that person is. You don't have to treat them right if you're just an animal. You can do what you want. You can make fun of them. You can be a racist if you want. You can do whatever you want to do. 
But if you're made in God's image, that changes your perspective. It makes a difference on how you think about yourself. You don't get yourself too high-minded. And it makes you think a lot differently about others that are around you. You come to respect those people a little bit more. Is he to do what comes naturally, or is he to deny himself and control himself? The one who believes that God exists is going to have more on the idea of controlling self rather than doing whatever it feels good at the moment or sounds good at the moment. Both men and women, fourth, both men and women were made by God and created equal. Malachi chapter 2, verse 10. People are responsible to God for what they do in the marriage relationship. It has a big impact on that. The ramifications of God being the creator is that there is an equality of people. We are His offspring. Every one of us is His offspring. Acts chapter 17, verse 28. Some are not made out of better dirt than others. Oh, let's get some of this bad dirt over here and make this person. Let's make some, some person out of this really good dirt, and that person is a much better person than that person. Oh, you came from a lion and you came from a dog, so therefore lions are the king of the animals and therefore you must be a lowly cur. That doesn't make any sense at all. When we are made in the image of God, we're going to have a better mindset about ourselves and we're going to have a better mindset about other people, even if they have genetic discrepancies from us, whatever they might be, whether it's an extra gene on the 23rd gene so that you have some problem or, or maybe you have one less gene in some area and you have some other kind of a problem and so it causes you to have some kind of uh, either uh, mental or physical disability, whatever it might be. Oh, so because you've got this, this quirk in your genetics, that means you're less of a person than somebody else. No. It's not all about genetics. It's about the fact that God created genetics and God created us and God made all the rules. And not only that, God expects us to respect one another. And He loved us so much that He sent His Son to die for us. There is an equality of people. Some are not better than others. None of the animals would meet man's needs either. When we look at that story in the garden and, and see Adam naming all the animals and finding out, wait a minute, they've all got somebody for them and I don't have anybody. God made somebody specific for him. A lot of people don't like that story. They, they, they want to think that, oh, we can do whatever we want. We can marry the same sex or we can marry an animal if we want. Or tell you what, let's just take an, uh, biology out of it and let's say we can marry our car. Do you, real, do you realize that somebody has married their car? It's crazy what people think that they can do with themselves. The one who made the world can call it to an end just like he called it into existence. What God created, he can destroy. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 6. He did destroy it partially in the flood, and he confused the languages. He can do whatever he wants to do. It's his. Indeed, it is the teaching of Scripture that God will destroy the world in fire. That will happen. That's what he says in 2 Peter. He will bring creation to its desired end. It was created for God. It wasn't created for us in the first place. It was created for us to work on and to do things on, but according to the will of God. There are a lot of things that people believe out there. We need to stick with the word of God. We need to listen to what God has said. He created us. He made us, and he made us in his image so that we could be good to one another and helpful to one another and encouraging to one another. And when we start believing things that are from, from out of nowhere, we're going to go the wrong direction every time. So we need to believe in God, not just simply because it's a good children's story, but because it's a savior of all humanity for us to believe in God and to live the way God would have us live.
Now, I know there's some, some people who are extreme people in both directions. There are some people who believe that if you don't believe what I say about God, then I'll just kill you and be done with it because you're getting in my way of my beliefs. But see, that kind of thing happens with people who do not believe in God. They want to stop everybody from believing in God at all. So that they'll say, I'll just kill you because you're not going with my set of values and believing what I believe about things. That's not good for humanity on either end of that. It's not good for us as souls either. Those people who do not believe in God do not believe in a soul. Those people who believe that God is just a figment of our imagination do not believe that there's anything after this life, and so it really doesn't matter. Let's just get people out of the way or things out of the way that we, that we don't need or we don't like so that we can do what we want to do. And there are religious fanatics that will do that same kind of thing. Does that make them fear, fear, fearing God-fearing people? No, it does not. They're doing just the same thing that the worldly people do. So what we need to do is listen to what God says and do it God's way and follow God's rules instead of making up our own as we go. If we listen to what God says, it'll make all the difference in the world. It'll make the difference to us personally and individually, and it'll make a difference in the entire world if we live for him. And so if you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, that he died and he rose again the third day, I know that's a big topic there in and of itself. Maybe we can spend some time on that one too. But let's just say you believe that just for the moment. If you believe that, then I urge you to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ so that you can have your forgiveness. All the sins that you've committed are gone away and you can be freed from the punishment or the consequences, if you will, of those sins. Then I urge you, to do that this, this evening. If you need our prayers as a brother or sister in Christ for some reason, then let that be known. We're going to sing a song. Won't you make your way to the front while we stand and while we sing it?